This is a 2021 Dodge Durango SRT Hellcat and it is just absurd. This is a three-row family SUV, like many three-row family SUVs, except this one has 710 horsepower, 645 pound-feet of torque. Do you remember a few years ago when Dodge came out with the regular Hellcat, the Challenger, and we all thought that was insane? Well, now there's a three-row SUV version, <laughs> and today I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my new online enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era. If you're looking to sell or buy a cool car from the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to go. If you're looking to sell a cool modern enthusiast car, you will get the most money, the most interest, the most bids on Cars and Bids. And if you're looking to buy something cool from the modern era, Cars and Bids has an amazing selection with daily auctions of crazy and interesting vehicles. Check it out at carsandbids.com. Okay, so let's talk basics. The Dodge Durango first came out for the 1998 model year. The current version has been on sale since 2011 without a redesign, which makes it one of the oldest designs in the car industry. But Dodge has updated it over the years, made changes, kept it modern, and that includes for 2021. It's getting a few new changes, including a new front end design, a new rear end, some new lighting, a few interior upgrades, and a 710 horsepower V8. Let me put that in perspective for you. The next most powerful three-row SUV is the Mercedes-AMG GLS 63. That vehicle costs about $140,000 and it has 603 horsepower, and it is insane. The fastest SUV in the world is the Bentley Bentayga Speed. It has about 630 horsepower. That vehicle is also insane, but the Durango Hellcat is insaner by any reasonable measure, and it's more powerful too. 710 horsepower in a three row SUV. This will do zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. What do you do with that? And get this, the people at Dodge tell me this will tow 8,700 pounds. So the Hellcat Durango costs about $85,000, but it has the acceleration, the performance of a Ferrari. It has the seating capacity of a minivan and it will tow like a pickup truck. <laughs> So that 85 grand for all that stuff in one vehicle doesn't really seem so bad. Okay, clearly I'm astonished by this thing, so it's time to take a closer look. So today I'm going to review the Durango Hellcat. First, I'm going to take you on a thorough tour and show you all of the interesting quirks and features of one of the most ridiculous vehicles in existence. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Durango Hellcat in the most obvious place, under the hood, the engine. This is the Hellcat motor put into a Dodge Durango. I just can't believe they did this, but actually I can believe it because it's Chrysler and they do crazy stuff like this all the time. Now, like I said, 710 horsepower, 645 pound-feet of torque, unreal numbers in a vehicle like this. It does zero to 60 in three and a half seconds and the quarter mile in around 11 and a half seconds. This family SUV runs an 11 from the factory. Absolutely wild. Now, like the Jeep Grand Cherokee Hellcat, which is called the Trackhawk, this is four-wheel drive but you can adjust where you want the power to go. Depending on your drive mode, you can get up to 70% of the power to the rear wheels, which is pretty cool. As for the title of most powerful three-row SUV, this isn't quite it. The Tesla Model X is probably more powerful. I say probably because Tesla has stopped quoting horsepower figures. They now just quote acceleration, but the Model X, the top version, will do zero to 60 in two and a half seconds. This is three and a half, so it's slower. So you gotta figure the Model X has a little more power, but 700 110 horsepower. It's not exactly anything to scoff at. And neither is the towing capacity. Like I said before, this will tow 8,700 pounds, which is truly insane. You can tow your drag racer car to the drag strip in your Durango, and then you can beat it 
<laughs> on the drag strip with your tow vehicle. <laughs> oh, the superlatives. This is just ridiculous. That gives you a sense of just how ridiculous. But Dodge was careful to point out to me that creating the Hellcat Durango involved more than just throwing in a giant engine. They made changes to every aspect of the vehicle, starting with the styling. Now, for 2021, all the new Durango models have a revised front end with sort of slimmer headlights, and it looks more modern. But the Hellcat version goes even further. You have a more aggressive lower grille down here and a little front lip spoiler to emphasize this car's muscular performance. Performance. And it's the same story in back. Again, all of the 21 Durango models have a slightly revised rear end with revised lighting back here, but the Hellcat again takes it a step further. You have two giant dual exhausts coming out below the bumper, and you have this spoiler, which looks like kind of a stupid afterthought. You really need a spoiler on an SUV, but Dodge tells me that at the top speed of this Durango, which by the way is 180 miles an hour, at the top speed, this spoiler can provide up to 150 pounds of downforce. So it has some effect, although most people will probably never feel it or use it in that capacity. And by the way, since I'm back here and talking exhaust, take a listen to this thing as it revs. <laughs> Keep in mind that this is a family SUV, a three row kid hauling family SUV that sounds like that. It's incredible. Now, Dodge is quick to point out that this exhaust, while beefy, it has noise control, they call it. So it doesn't just drone if you're driving at higher speeds on the highway. It doesn't just sound really aggressive all the time. It kind of quiets down so the sound is more tolerable if you're just cruising at a steady RPM. And of course, Chrysler made changes to the Durango's suspension and chassis in order to hellcatify it. It has stiffer springs and sway bars, just improved sportier suspension to make it handle more sporty to go along with the better performance. And of course, it has bigger brakes for better stopping power, 15.75 inch brakes up front, almost 16 inches of brake up here and 14 inch brakes in back. They are huge, but that makes sense. This is a very powerful, very large vehicle and you want to make sure you can get it stopped once it gets going. With these brakes, I'm sure you can. And next up, still on the outside of the Durango, I want to talk about one of my very favorite things about it, and that would be the subtlety. <laughs> there is not much badging on the outside of the Hellcat Durango to let you know what you're looking at. You have one Hellcat badge here, you have two more on the fenders, one on each side, and then you have one in the grill. But it's not like it says Hellcat, it's just a picture of the Hellcat. So most people probably won't even realize what they're looking at. Aside from that, there's nothing really to tell that <laughs> this is a 700 plus horsepower SUV. There's just no way to know. With the Jeep Trackhawk, you have the yellow brakes and that's a pretty good giveaway, but you don't have that here. And even these wheels aren't all that big or excessive. 20 inch wheels, pretty standard fare on SUVs at this price point. It just doesn't look Hellcatty, And I love that. I love the sleeper effect. You could totally <laughs> scare people, take off these badges, and you could beat out Mustangs, Challengers, Camaros, and they would never have any clue that you were driving a 700 horsepower car until they were behind you. But when you climb inside the Hellcat Durango, there are a few more giveaways to what it is. The moment you open the door on the door sill, it says supercharge, so you know this won't be a standard Durango. But then you get in and there are quite a few more badges in here than there are outside. For instance, the steering wheel in the center doesn't say Durango, Dodge, it says SRT. Same deal, the floor mat, SRT, not Dodge or Durango or anything like that. Also, the seats say SRT with the Hellcat logo on them in front and in the second row in back, they all say SRT. So it really does emphasize the sportiness of this Durango. And beyond just the sportiness, as you might expect from a car at this price point, the interior has been dressed up in here compared to a standard Durango as well. You have Alcantara inserts in the middle of the seats, which look very nice and they feel good when you're sitting in them. And you also have stitching all throughout this interior, this white contrast stitching, the seats, the steering wheel, the dashboard, just white stitching everywhere. Again, helps to emphasize the relative luxuriousness of this Durango, which is nice considering in addition to the performance model, it's also 
also the top of the line, most expensive version. But anyway, next I wanna move on to the SRT stuff in here. And to do that, we have to talk infotainment. Now for 2021, the Durango has a slightly larger infotainment screen than before, and it's a little bit better, just a crisper resolution, and it's more responsive to your touch, it responds quicker, you can see, a little bit more easy to use, and a little bit better laid out, more intuitive, just a little improved over the prior Durango infotainment. The latest system also has wireless Apple CarPlay, which is starting to make its way into the car industry. Not too many cars have that yet, but the new Durango does for 21. But like I said, we're gonna talk SRT stuff in here. And to do that, you go into your SRT dashboard and you are presented with three different choices. I'm gonna start with race options. You click on that and you can configure two rather interesting things you can't normally do in a three row family SUV. The first is launch control. You can use this screen to activate launch control if you tap here on the screen, but you can also activate launch control more quickly than that if you want. Just press this little button in the center control stack, and then that activates launch control in case you need a quick launch and you don't want to go through a menu. But anyway, back to the screen. It's not just for turning on launch control, it's also for configuring what RPM you want the vehicle to launch. So if you want a relatively tame launch, you can put it down at like 15, 16, 1800 RPM, but you can also dial it way up in case you want to do some really hard launches at the highest RPM possible and spin all four tires. Now, the other thing you can do in this section of the SRT dashboard is you can configure your shift light. Specifically, you can let the car know when you want the shift light to turn on in each gear, which is pretty impressive. You can configure exactly where you want it to come on, and that way when you're driving fast on a drag strip, you can shift at your desired RPM because you've configured your shift light to come on then. Pretty crazy for a three-row SUV. Your next menu in your SRT dashboard is your drive modes. And here you can select between various different drive modes as you can see. And this is the place where you can adjust exactly where your all wheel drive system is going. If you have the car in most normal modes, it's 50-50, but if you put it in track mode, then it's gonna be rear biased with that 70% split to the rear, like I mentioned before. But as you can see, you can adjust various different drive modes and you can even set up a custom mode and adjust each portion of the drive mode individually if you have a very specific desire for your personal drive mode. Next up, you can go into the SRT performance pages section, which is pretty cool. For one thing, it can measure your acceleration, your quarter mile runs, your eighth mile runs, your best, your last one. It shows you exactly your speed, your time. That's pretty cool. And it can do the same with your acceleration, zero to 60, and show you exactly how fast you've been accelerating your last time, your best, whatever. Again, pretty special. In this section, you also have access to an enormous amount of gauges, nine total, showing you all sorts of different vehicle measurements, everything from usual stuff like your coolant temperature to more nerdy drag racer things like your intake air temperature and your air fuel ratio, stuff that most people won't worry about unless they're drag racing their Durango. In here, you also have a history section, which will give you a running history of your power usage as you've been driving along. Where did you accelerate? Where did you brake? Where were you using a lot of power? over the last few minutes of driving. And there's also a G-force section in here, which will of course give you your G-forces and not just side to side, but also front to back in case you've been braking hard or accelerating hard as well. Pretty amazing. And if you wanna see all of this SRT stuff, which you probably will since you bought the Hellcat Durango, you don't have to go through the infotainment system to find it. All you have to do is press this SRT button in the center control stack and it pulls it right up. That button is one of the closest ones to you and they've put it there because they figure people will frequently want to use a shortcut to check out their SRT-ness. And it's not just in the center screen that you can see all that stuff. The gauge cluster also shows a lot of performance items. You can look in the gauge cluster to see your zero to 60 times, your quarter times, you have a lap timer in there, your G-forces, your tire pressures. A lot of the performance stuff that's in your center console is also in your gauge cluster for an even more handy display right in front of your eyes. But, all of the cool things about the Durango, all of the performance, the engine power, the slick technology, can't hide the fact that the Durango is pretty old. Like I said, this body style came out in 2011, and it shows its age in various places you start to notice when you spend time with it. For instance, in the center console storage area, you open it up, and it's mostly taken up by a Blu-ray disc slot. So you don't really get any center console storage 
because this slot is here. Bad packaging, of course. Other automakers would be hiding it somewhere else, but this is an old design. This is a space they had, so they used it. And speaking of the center console, same deal further forward, where most of your front storage compartment is taken up by a wireless charger. When the Durango came out, there was no wireless charging. They had to add it later, and this is the spot they chose. And again, it steals a lot of your storage. Same deal with charging in this car. You can see there are a couple of charge ports to the left of that wireless charger, but there's no cigarette lighter outlet style port. That one has been moved to the passenger side footwell next to the glove box because they ran out of space in the old school center console to fit all of these things. Now, if they fully redesigned this car and gave it a completely new center console, they could find better ways to package all this stuff, but instead they've just kind of added it piecemeal over the years and it shows. And it's not just there that you have a problem. Another good example of this car's age, shift into reverse and look at the quality of this backup camera. On this nice new screen with a new technology, you have this pixelated, not very good, low resolution backup camera, which is a disappointment at this price point and in this year, frankly. And there's more than just that. You have a floor mounted parking brake in here, which is a really old school design. Basically everyone else has gone to an electronic parking brake with a button, but this is an old car. That's how they've engineered it. And it's difficult to change at this point. And the gauge cluster is almost completely analog. Even though there is a screen in the center, you have analog gauges on either side. And even that screen is relatively small and it has to conform to the shape of kind of an analog gauge cluster over it. Again, it looks very old and it sort of helps give away this Durango's age. And the aging design is also clear when you start to look at third row seat access. These days, basically every three row SUV has a very easily accessible third row. Usually you just push a button or pull one lever and the seat folds down and slides forward, comes out of your way. You don't have to do anything else. Not in the Durango. Here you have to pull this lever on the side of the seat that folds the seat down. Then in a second motion, you have to pull this red loop and actually lift the entire weight of the seat in order to get it out of the way for easier access to the third row. That is not what most rivals do. Most of them make it a lot easier than that. You don't have to do any lifting, but in the Durango you do. Again, older design. That's how they did it back in 2011, but its age is showing. And another place where the Durango shows its age a little bit is back here with the charge ports. You have two USB chargers back here, which is nice, but they're the old school USB style, not the new USB-C, which I'm seeing more and more in newer cars. But I do like the fact that you have a household style power outlet back here, which can be very useful to charge various different things that you can't charge with a USB. And I love to see that easily accessible in the second row. Another thing I like back here is the screens. The backs of the front seats contain these folded screens. If you fold them up, they turn on. And then of course you can use them as rear seat passengers. And the cool thing is you have various different inputs, including HDMI. So you could plug in an Xbox back here, I guess. And you could be playing Xbox while you're being driven along. Childhood today has improved dramatically from 15 years ago when you were lucky to have a VHS player in the back of your Chevy Venture. Now, these screens are controlled with this remote, which works in kind of an interesting way. It's just a usual remote, but you can change between screens with this little toggle switch on the right. You can go between screen one and screen two, and then you can adjust whatever is on each screen. One remote for two screens for a family SUV, I bet that will cause some arguments with children, but screens and a remote, at least that will keep them quiet on a long trip. Now, as for the third row seat, I already showed you how to access it by folding forward the second row, or because this Durango has second row captain's chairs, of course, you could just walk right through the middle of the second row to get to the third row. Now, the third row is tight, but it's not as small as I was expecting. It's not great for adults, of course, for any long trips, but you can get back there and have a little bit of room, even if you're an adult, and kids should be okay okay back there. It's bigger than you'd think, given that this isn't that huge of an SUV. It's not a Chevy Tahoe or a Ford Expedition. It's a little smaller, and it has a relatively usable third row. One drawback to the third row, though, again, going back to the Durango's age, there's no charging ports back there at all. Not USB, not household, not USB-C, nothing. So third row passengers can't charge any devices. That's very unusual for three row SUVs. Every new three row I've been in has had charge ports in back, but the Durango being older, they're just not back there. And next up, we 
move on to the cargo area of the Hellcat Durango, which as you can see is actually rather large considering that this is a three row SUV and not a huge one. It's surprising to me how much space is behind the third row. Not a lot, of course, but some, which is uncommon for a three row SUV of this size. And if you lift up the cargo floor, there's even more space underneath a little storage area where you can stick stuff if you don't want it exposed or rolling around in the cargo area. Now, as you might expect for a modern three row SUV, the third row is incredibly easy to fold and get out of the way. If you want more space back here and you don't need the seats, you just pull up on this little lever, push the seat forward and it's gone. Do the same thing over on the other side and the seat is down there too. It takes just seconds to fold the seats down. And it's the same deal if you want to get them back up, you just pull on this little strap, the seat comes right back up and you can get it into place. Same deal on the other side. So these seats fold down and right back up very easily in case you want more space back here. But with that said, there is no power folding for these third row seats. Most SUVs at this price point do have power folding and then rising back up for their third rows. Not so in the Durango, although frankly, this is a lot quicker than sitting there pressing the button and watching the seats go down. And speaking of power operated stuff back here, the tailgate is rather curious. You saw me a second ago raise it up automatically. That's pretty standard. The weird part is when you go to close it, you can see there's no button to close the tailgate on the lower edge of it like there is in basically every other vehicle. I looked around to try to find where the button was and I finally located it inside the cargo area. You have to press this and then it beeps and gives you like two seconds to flee so the tailgate doesn't close on you and only then does it actually start to close. It's an odd place for the power tailgate closer button but that's where it is. And since we're talking weird quirks there are a few other quirky quirks in this interior that I should mention. One is the heated steering wheel button, which is in the middle of the center control stack and absolutely huge. It is twice the size of the heated seat button. <laughs> Not really sure why it is so big, but it is so you can really heat your steering wheel. Also strange is the climate control vents. You can see they're rimmed in black to match the rest of the interior, but there's this tiny little silver piece in the center, which is the exact size of the area where you can move around the climate vent adjuster. You can see it fits into this area up, down, side to side. This is strange. The trim on the climate control vent doesn't go around the whole vent, but only around this tiny area with the climate control vent adjuster switch thing. <laughs> what an odd piece of design, but that's what they've done. And so those are the quirks and features of the Dodge Durango Hellcat. <laughs> now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. <laughs> I, I can't wait. All right, driving the Durango <laughs> Hellcat. Uh, I have wanted to review this vehicle for quite some time, even before it existed. A lot of people pointed out I've never reviewed a Dodge Durango. That's because I was waiting. I assumed they would make this vehicle, and now that they have, now it's time to review the Durango, and so I shall drive it in the manner it was intended to be driven. I'm driving this here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and to the people of Charlotte, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's fast, to say the least. <laughs> it doesn't really surprise me the speed, but only because I've driven all of the other uh, Hellcat type products, uh, the Challenger, the Charger, the Grand Cherokee. But it is weird to look back and see that third row and accelerate at that pace. That was insane. And you have this sound that's unbelievable. Uh, the people at Dodge told me the exhaust is really beefy and muscular, but it's toned down a little bit compared to the Challenger and the Charger. They figured that people who wanted one of these wouldn't quite want the same level of insanity. I will say driving this around for even just a couple minutes became clear to me very quickly that ride quality uh, has suffered compared to the standard Durango. They had to stiffen up the suspension to make it handle better, but when you do that, you lose ride quality. And that certainly is true here. And you can tell as you drive this around, this is not the comfortable luxury SUV that like the high-end Durango models tend to be. Driving it around normally, it can be a pretty tame vehicle, which I find to be interesting. There are kind of three ways you can tell that it's anything other than a regular Durango. One is that harsh ride quality. Two is the supercharger whine, which you hear basically every time you touch the throttle. But the third one is just the instant throttle response. I mean, even just a tap of the throttle, you could tell there is so much more to go. 
I love it. I love it. Now, steering and handling is pretty good, no question. This is a relatively large vehicle to be discussing steering and handling, and they have done a good job of neutralizing its size and its body roll. Um, I'm actually surprised the steering itself is a little lazy, a little slow, but the handling, the car's ability to pull out of corners, to go through hard, uh, is excellent. And it surprises me quite a bit, actually, how well they've done at making sure this handles well, but I guess it shouldn't surprise me that much considering how harsh the ride is. So you have that stiffer suspension, of course it's gonna handle a lot better. Um, I do wonder, though, if maybe they've gone a little too far in the direction of performance. I think most people won't care that much about the handling, but they will want a slightly more compliant ride, and it's pretty rough. One interesting thing about the Durango, and frankly all of Chrysler's recent products is, even though a lot of journalists will complain that they're not being redesigned, they don't seem to be needing to be redesigned. Uh, people are still buying them. The Challenger, the Grand Cherokee is selling well, it's also 10 years old. They still are all selling. And I think what Chrysler started to figure out is you don't actually have to update the platform. Nobody cares about that. What you have to do is just sort of modernize the styling, add better technology, and people will continue to buy. Now, there are those little ways that I showed you, like the backup camera resolution, the foot-mounted parking brake, where you can tell it's an older vehicle, but those are small. And, you know, you have 700 horsepower to make yourself feel better about everything. Ridiculous car. Truly ridiculous car. And I enjoy it, and it's great, and it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it'll be a great family vehicle and tow vehicle and sports car for families crazy enough to take the plunge into the Hellcat Durango world. And so that's the Dodge Durango SRT Hellcat. The Durango's design is over 10 years old, and I shouldn't be complaining about it, but truthfully, I adore this car. Over 700 horsepower in a three-row family SUV. And it is a very exciting three-row family SUV, of course. Anyway, now it's time to give the Durango Hellcat a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Durango Hellcat looks nice, nothing incredibly special, but the Durango is attractive enough and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, which gives it a 9 out of 10. Handling is excellent for a vehicle this size and it gets a 5 out of 10. Fun factor is huge given the power and the speed and the driving experience and the sound and it gets a 7 out of 10. Cool factor is decent, most people won't know what it is, but those who do will certainly look twice and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 33 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It's reasonably well equipped with some nice tech, although it's missing some easy stuff like an electronic parking brake or a sunroof, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Comfort is not great for an SUV at this price point. It's surprisingly harsh, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is fine, the interior is nice enough, but it certainly could be better, and reliability is never a certainty with Chrysler vehicles, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is great with three row seating, good cargo space, good towing capacity, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Finally, value, and it's very expensive at over $85,000, but it's also incredibly good at doing everything, speed, performance, towing, family hauling, it really is a jack of all trades, so the price doesn't seem so bad, and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 34 out of 50. Added up, and the Doug score is 67 out of 100, which places the Hellcat Durango here against rivals. It has a surprisingly strong showing, reaching towards or even above the far more expensive luxury performance SUVs. But the simple truth is the Durango has more seats, more capability, and more power than anything on this list, and it's faster than nearly everything, too. This, <laughs> this is so nuts. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat>